Ada Atero. Welcome, fun out of the war on news. Your weekly sacred council on assault on current affairs, being live for the palatial Stratus news bunker, buried deep beneath the heart of the Greyland Republic. If this show was a stupid pop culture fad, and tonight's political media crumbs against reason kill zone. The Double Dipper from Dipton Double Dips employment numbers by cut and pasting the same 170,000 jobs from the last budget into this year's one. John Key defends Treasury predictions of the rapture. Boot camps simply make criminals fitter. Plus this week's Sex in the Super City, Wanko the Week, and the Barack Obama People's Hair of the Week Award. Leading the war on news this week, brothers and sisters. The only thing more disruptive than Martin Devlin acting like a cock on a domestic flight is Wellington Airport's decision to branch into outdoor advertising with their Wellywood sign. Wellingtonians like the following things. Dubstep. Ugh. Universal membership to Fat Freddy's Drop if you have ever visited Lower Hut. Turtlenecks. A misplaced sense of superiority over Aucklanders and pretending that playing ukuleles is somehow meaningful. Wellingtonians don't like the following. Large three metre lettering that displays their fawning little brother syndrome by sucking up and copying an American idea. Brothers and sisters, there's nothing more militant than a dub-stepping Wellingtonian with a ukulele fetish. And already, some are planning to burn the Wellywood sign to the ground. Build it or burn it? I don't care, because it's in Wellington. But that shouldn't stop us making fun of it. And here are some alternatives. If it was political, if it was in Auckland, if it was honest, if it was really honest, and if it was really, really, really honest. Brothers and sisters, shocking news that the poor farmer man pays almost $1,500 tax per year, which is less tax than the beneficiaries they're always blaming everything on. Some cruel and unpatriotic bastards say that farmers get everything. They get to steal our water, pollute our water, create global warming gases, charge us eye-watering world market prices for products they damage our environment for, and they get monopolistic protection by their entire industry in the form of Fonterra. Fano, that's not a fair assessment. Yes, they get all those things, but they also get to own their own political party as well. <laughs> Farmers won't be satisfied until Dem City folks sacrifice every firstborn child to them and make the banjo an official language above te reo. Brothers and sisters, as cruel an irony as digging up Pike River miners, just to bury them again, the former president of the International Monetary Fund has been charged with raping a maid at his hotel. The cruel irony is that normally the IMF rape third world nations, not actual individuals. Dominic Strauss-Kahn's defence that he was actually attempting to demonstrate IMF fiscal readjustment policy doesn't look like a jury pleaser. To the headlines, Farno. The Finance Minister Bill English got the nickname Double Dipper from Dipton for taking a housing allowance for a Wellington house he had signed over into his wife's name while cutting public services and demanding everyone else do with less. But I think the Double Dipper from Dipton should receive double the dip after doubling up once again. In the 2010 budget, Bill English promised the government would grow employment by 170,000 jobs. For 2011, Bill has simply cut and paste last year's promise and claimed he's going to create another 170,000 jobs next year. That's 340,000 jobs he's pretended to have created. Budget 2010, Bill promises 170,000 jobs. Budget 2011, Bill promises the exact same level of jobs. Why can't the mainstream media pick up on the exact same lie spun about job creation in the past budget by Bill English? Did none of them read both budgets and note he's made the same promise twice? Close up on Tuesday couldn't look into this because they had far more pressing issues to focus on. Mark Sainsbury had an exclusive interview with two alleged vampires to contend with rather than pointing out that the finance minister is making the same false employment promise twice. Fano, now while I didn't bother watching Mark interview the two 
alleged vampires. I'm going to go out on a bit of a limb here and suggest that it will turn out that they are not, in fact, members of the living undead Brides of Dracula, the dreaded Nosferatu, and are, in fact, stupid teenage Twilight fans who drank some blood to make their boring suburban little lives a twee bit more exciting. That is what passes as current affairs in this country. Horny teenagers who bite each other is more important than the finance minister telling porkies about employment. I hate you, Warris of News. I hate you. Moving on with the headlines, Farno. So, everyone is looking at Treasury's predictions of growth with the same scepticism we all viewed Harold Camping's predictions of the rapture on his family radio network. Harold's predictions may have had a little bit more veracity if Family Radio hadn't followed up his claim the world would end tomorrow with a five-day weather forecast. Fano, the budget only looks good if we believe the 4% growth forecast from Treasury, so let's compare the predictions from 2008. They claimed we would get 1.5% growth, 2.3% growth, and then 3.2% growth. We actually got... Minus 1.1% growth, minus 0.4% growth, and minus 0.1% growth. Treasury have been out by as much as 3.1% of GDP as little as last year, and we're supposed to believe 4% growth next year based on a Rugby World Cup, which is still only half sold out, and Christchurch rebuild, which still keeps suffering from aftershocks. Who the bloody hell would be so vacant as to believe this bullshit? Enter stage right, Optimus Prime, John Key. John Key believes Treasury's rapture predictions and has come out defending these fairy tale growth assumptions by pointing to a wide range of forecasters who all agree with him, like the ANZ, BNZ, Deutsche Bank, Goldman Sachs, and Westpac, yeah. All of whom have been wrong in the last three years as well. Indeed, the Westpac chief economist, Brendan O'Donovan, at the beginning of this year claimed, <laughs> and I quote, Personally, I think New Zealand could have a rip snorter of a year, and I think we could be on the cusp of a golden decade in terms of economic prosperity. That's the guy John Key wants to hold up to prove Treasury's bullshit predictions aren't bullshit? O'Donovan is so insanely positive, he makes John Key look like a manic depressive on Suicide Watch. This seems to be a mentality amongst some that if we just put on a smile and a cheery disposition, this recession will be over and the lambs will be lying down with the lions and world peace will break out. If Westpac's chief economist had been on the Titanic as it was sinking, he'd be explaining how great the ocean views are and that now is the best time to buy another ticket. Far now, the economy is in free fall because the same tide slash public services more tax cuts bullshit can't deal with the parameters of the 2008 collapse. The Reserve Bank Governor, Alan Bollard, points out in his book Crisis that the Americans had written up a quadrillion dollars in credit default swaps. That's a thousand trillion dollars. Brothers and sisters, we aren't even halfway through this recession yet. Moving on with the headlines, Fano. This government love boot camps and seem to believe that spending over half of the $55 million package supposedly aimed at unemployed youth on pointless military boot camps is a great use of money in the steepest recessions of the Great Depression. It isn't, and the government know this, and that is why Paula Bennett is hiding the results by refusing to release any details about how many child criminals go on to commit more crime after being sent to military boot camps. This government have overseen a teenage unemployment rate that has now soared to 27.5%, which is hilarious when you consider how many bright-eyed, bubbly young Gen Y first-time voters flock to John Key and his change mantra. What he actually meant by change was loose change, as in all you get now is loose change rather than an actual job. How the fuck blowing half the youth unemployment package on a bunch of military boot camps that don't work is supposed to get young people jobs is well beyond my ability to comprehend. The academic research overwhelmingly shows these knee-jerk boot camps don't work and what they in fact seem to produce are fitter criminals. I'm not sure producing criminals who can outrun the police is a positive, and how does any of this conservative knee-jerk crap actually help young people get jobs? Fano, are you feeling sexy? It's Sex in the Super City time. John B. 
Banks has attacked the super city, saying it's a disaster. Really? The racially divisive and spiteful former mayor who lost to Len Brown and who is now replacing the architect of the super city, Rodney Hyde, in the Epsom seat, now says the super city is a disaster on Leighton Smith's Radio ZB Talk Hate radio station, does he? Seeing as Leighton Smith believes global warming is a hoax, any opinion originating from his program should be given the same level of distance around Japanese nuclear reactors damaged by tsunamis. John Banks should be focusing his derision at his mate Rodney Hyde, who screwed the pooch on this one by ramming the annexation of Auckland through under a misuse of urgency minus the kind of deliberative process a massive change like this demands. The super city was supposed to have 8,500 staff to do the work for 10,000 staff. Yet only has 7,800 staff. For John Banks to throw his toys over the super city now, while it was the party that supported him who did all the cocking up, is a little like blaming the Bible for getting the dates of the rapture wrong. And while we're talking about the little oompa loompa of hate, brothers and sisters, it is my pleasure to announce that I I am unofficially the new campaign manager for Rodney Hyde Independent Candidate for Epsom 2011. Now, some have claimed I'm merely doing this to split the vote in Epsom between Banks and Hyde so that whatever loser candidate national appoints wins by default. That is a dreadful accusation to make. I care deeply about Rodney and the Shire Volk of Epsom. Rodney and I have decided that it would be best that he stands as an independent candidate after the shabby way that awful Dr. Dan Don rolled him and called him toxic damaged goods. Rodney Hyde, independent candidate for Epsom 2011, has a catchy ring about it. Remember, Rodney, they were mean and hateful towards you. You can prove them all wrong by giving the good people of Epsom the democratic right to decide if you should still represent them. Go on, Rodney, you know you want to. And I only have your best interests at heart, the way John Key has the working poor of New Zealand's best interests at heart. But now let's hand out this week's Wanko the Week Award. Sisters, this week's Wango of the Week has to go to attempts by America into forcing us to dump Pharmax so the American pharmaceutical companies can implement their brutal form of medicine for the rich into this country. It's all part of the free trade deal that John Key wants to secretly sign us up to before the election. This oxymoronically named free trade deal will do the following. More expensive medicines, no local content and broadcasting, weaker controls on overseas investment in New Zealand, foreign investment suing the government for millions in offshore tribunals, weaker regulations of the financial services, undermining action on climate change, delays and restrictions on agricultural market access to the US. John Key breathlessly told a compliant mainstream media that we would make billions and billions from this free trade deal with a America and the compliant mainstream media breathlessly repeated those claims with no critical analysis whatsoever. How humiliating then for our compliant mainstream uncritical media when WikiLeaks revealed the billions and billions claims is utter nonsense and an outright lie. It turns out our negotiator for the free trade deal privately complained to the Americans that we get nothing out of this free trade deal and trying to con you New Zealanders into accepting it would be difficult. Close Up couldn't do a story about this issue this week as they were too busy interviewing alleged vampires. But John Key is lying to us about this free trade deal making us billions and billions. In the exact same way Jerry Brownlee lied to us about billions and billions to be made from mining on conservation land. It is extraordinary how far New Zealanders are prepared to stretch John Key's smile and wave political capital to justify policy so contrary to our national interests as dismantling Pharmac for American corporate gain. Let's end the show by handing out this week's Barack Obama People's Here of the Week Award. Brothers and sisters, this week Barack Obama People's Here of the Week Award has to go to Israel for their surprise at Barack's comments that they need to go back to the 1967 borders, which seems a bit faked, especially as the UN has been calling for Israel to go back to the 1967 borders and stop occupying Palestinian land since, well, 1967. 
Israel's shock seems more at being told by America that the party is over and the whole brutal occupation of the Palestinian people can't be tolerated. Now most of the Arab world has access to Twitter and Facebook and are for the first time threatening to overthrow all the Middle Eastern dictatorships we prop up. Gun enthusiast and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu claims any attempt to go back to the 1967 borders would destroy Israel. Yeah, I think apartheid South Africa used that type of excuse to keep Nelson Mandela locked up for a couple of decades as well. Isn't it funny how repressive regimes always justify their brutality by claiming their security is at threat? Palestinian kids throwing stones at armoured tanks isn't a threat to Israel, and glorified skyrockets that steer like a cow isn't much of a threat either. More Israelis die in car crashes than Palestinian rocket attacks. That's it for tonight, folks. Don't forget, Citizen A plays Friday, 7.30 p.m., Freeview 21 and Sky 89. Follow me on my Citizen Bomber Twitter and Facebook site. It has all the shows posted up online and allows you to befriend other like-minded citizens for romantic news moments. Good night, New Zealand. You stay classy, Aotearoa. Righto.